the point of discussing three important points as to why there should be a separation of soul and spirit. Our first point, which we have covered, I suppose, briefly, is the point that says we better understand our Bible by the separation of soul and spirit. This subject is a awesome subject, let's say, and we'll not get to the fullness or greater extent of it at any one uh, point of teaching, I suppose. But to me, it is very important to have a separation and understanding of the scriptures. There's a separation between God dealing with people through the law and dealing with them in grace. There was a distinction between God dealing with people before the cross and after the cross. And there is a distinction in the scriptures between God dealing with men before the day of Pentecost and after the day of Pentecost. So we have several lines of distinction uh, in the scriptures whereby we more clearly see what it is God is saying. He has not said the same thing to all men at any time. And I know this is a little hard for people to take because we always felt like if God said it, you better do it. If God said it, he meant it. If God said it to Abraham, he meant it for us. If he said it to Noah, he meant it for us. And that's not so. There's no way that we can uh, co-mingle these dispensations and periods of time where God dealt with men specifically in that day as opposed to a different way in another day. We cannot take those things and say this is what God means because this is what God is. God is multiplicity. That is that he could say one thing and deal with Adam in one way uh, and he could deal with Noah in another way, he could deal with Abraham in another way, and he dealt with Isaiah in another way. And certainly Jesus, under the law, was dealt with by God different than any of the other four ways that God dealt with men in the earlier part of the Old Testament in those different dispensations. So we can't just say because God said it, that's the way God is. God is, is able to be all things at all times, and we need to understand our times and what he's saying today. Before the cross, God never told anybody they had to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved because Christ had not yet come and the cross was not yet given. And certainly after the day of Pentecost, God dealt with people who now were to be saved by what Jesus did rather than what they did. A difference took place. And I think that's very important. As we go into our second point, this is especially important. Our second point in the importance of why there is a separation between soul and spirit is that we might better understand ourselves. Uh, the first point was to better understand the Bible. The second point is to better understand ourselves. Now, a lot of people give no credence to ourselves, but we do in the Christ life. We give a very strong credence to ourselves, not like New Age people would not like a certain cult or ism would, but we give certain importance to self because we see self, the human self, as incomplete without Christ as the life. Thus you must be born again to be a fulfilled human being. Well, if we are to better understand ourself, then we have to understand God's dealings with us, particularly in soul. We spend a lot of time in the Christ life message identifying the fact that the believer is dealt with by God in spirit through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and each of us are, definitely are, what Christ was in those extents. His death is our death, his burial is our burial, his resurrection is our resurrection, and so our identification to Christ is, is very uh, uh, potent in our understanding. But to really understand ourselves, we need to look into soul. As we said, we spent a lot of time dealing with who we are in spirit, Christ in us, but now let's look at uh, what we are in soul. And I think to better understand this, we should go to Genesis, the second chapter. So let's turn to Genesis chapter 2 <coughs> and read about the uh, existence of the soul or the first place that soul is mentioned in the scriptures in Genesis chapter 2. <clears throat> now we're at the uh, point of creation and verse 7 tells us what it was that happened. Uh, Genesis 2 and 7, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground 
and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Now, several things happened in this verse, and let's just briefly mention them. What God did, according to uh, one of the other writers in the Old Testament, perhaps Job, that God stooped down and took dust of the ground, dirt of the ground, and spit upon it and molded or shaped him a man, and he was lifeless like a sculptured piece, and then God breathed into the sculptured piece uh, that was formed in his image and likeness, he breathed into him the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Now, I think this is very important that this seventh verse says that man became a living soul. He didn't become a spirit. He became a living soul by this. So God breathing, taking his breath and breathing into him breath, made him a soulish person, meaning that he now had life in his soul, he had the breath of God in his soul, which made the soul comparable to making a choice. Now, why did it come like this? We teach very strongly in the Christ life that Adam, until he made his choice to obey Satan rather than God, had no spirit, because spirit comes by choice. Spirit comes by what we believe and whom we believe. But he got a living soul. Why does the scripture say living soul? Because his mind was so produced by God in the breath of God to have life in it enough to make a decision. So the soul of man is the part of man that makes the decisions. This is what made him a free moral agent, as we say technically. He was a free moral agent created by God now with life in his soulish part to make a decision. Don't believe he had spirit at that time. Now, of course, by body, which was a sculptured piece into which God breathed, which was a soul, he now had body and soul, which was the a means by which uh, he would make this decision and fulfill spirit. And we do see that body and soul may produce or create an aura that I call the spirit of man, but the spirit of man is a non-functioning uh, spirit or aura because the moment Adam believed what the devil said, he had the sin nature in him, and now with the nature he had a spirit, and that spirit was the spirit of Satan, as the New Testament is to tell us in time. So he now has a living soul, and the soul is a mechanism by which he makes choice. He has a mind. In the soul is the mind. Now the soul, as we well know, is made of intellect, will, and emotion. And since we see soul in this respect, it's important that we understand that God gave to human beings the ability to make decisions. Why was this a part of the living soul? It is because the making of decisions is how we come to know ourselves, our real self, by our decisions. All the way through life, human beings are forced to the knowledge of who they are by the decisions they make. It is your decisions that do not create you, but bring you to the knowledge of who you are. Your decisions do that. That's why the scripture says, believe a mind function. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. You will become a new creation, and you will become what God's intention for you is. By believing. Why? It is your decision making that makes the difference. When you make a decision for Christ, you have in that decision brought about a choice determining who you are. That it is not in that choice who you are, but that is a decision bringing you to the determination of who you are. Now, I mean by that, that your numerous decisions finally get you to who you think you are. Uh, for instance, in a lifetime, a person said, well, I wish I hadn't done that. I wish I hadn't made that decision. I wish I hadn't gone here. I wish I hadn't gone there. So the making of their decisions is helping them to come to know what kind of person they are, what kind of, what kind of person you are. You are not necessarily the person of your decisions, but your making of decisions helps you to know your weaknesses, your strength, and something about yourself. 
But then let's go to another portion of Scripture. Back in Genesis 1 and verse 27, we read something important about the sculptured man. It says, And so God created man in his own image, and in the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Now what this says is that all human beings in their created part body and soul part are created in the image and likeness of God. Uh, that means that this is the way God would look. Not exactly, of course, but this is the way God would look. Uh, he'd have two arms, and, uh, hands with fingers on it, and legs and feet and uh, hair and so forth, because this is the image of God. Now, Coming to the knowledge of who we are, it is necessary that we understand the difference between God's breath in human beings, the soul, and God's spirit, which is Christ in us. Understanding the difference in these two. The breath of God did not make man a spiritual being it merely gave him the right or the ability to make a decision. Whenever a person is born again, on the other hand, and God puts his son in us, his spirit by the son, when that son spirit goes into us, it supersedes everything else in our life. Christ becomes all to God. So now we have a balance between soul and spirit helping us to understand ourselves. My soul is the determination, determining factor of what it is I'm going to be in spirit. Let's take a look at the, at the uh, center first and uh, see if we can kind of draw some pictures to <clears throat> make this better uh, understood. Let's take a person that's unconverted, body, soul, and spirit. Unconverted person has a, has a, a Satan nature in them, so let's just put Satan here instead of Christ, the op opposite to Christ in God's plan. Now, this, this person has a decision-making mechanism in soul. He can make a choice. He has a ability to decide what it is he's going to be as a self. Well, those decisions that he makes, soulish decisions, are a part of his mind operation. But when he comes into the world, he doesn't really know any difference. He doesn't know any difference between soul and Satan's spirit, the sin nature. He doesn't know any difference because that's all he has ever known. He has never known any difference between soul and spirit coming into this world. So he goes along and he finally realizes that he's not really making these decisions, but there's some other force in him that makes these decisions, or is prompting his decisions. So he's like the man in Romans 7, the things he doesn't want to do, he does all the time, things he doesn't want to do, the things he wants to do, he can't get done. And so it's at that point that we have the first interjection between soul and spirit for the sinner. What do we call that interjection? We call it conviction. The Holy Spirit plants a wedge between soul and spirit by causing him to come to an independent decision from the spirit, from Satan. He has always thought he was all right. He was doing exactly what Satan wanted. But now he's gotten into trouble and the Holy Spirit has caused a wedge, a separation become between his soul and spirit, and Satan. 
soul and Satan. And so for the first time, he is thinking independent. The Holy Spirit has moved into his mind with the work we call conviction and has made him see that as a self, as a human self here, I've been misled and I cannot save myself. I need a savior. I need a savior. Well, he didn't know Satan was there. He's never known Satan was there. All he knows by conviction is that I need to make some different decisions. I need to make a decision for God. I need to make a decision for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you understand this. When we talk this technically, we talk about him having Satan as his nature. Uh, we've always called it a sin nature, but the, John said it was Satan who was a sinner from the beginning, so we don't beat around the bush here. We just say it was a Satan nature. He had the Satan nature. Every soul that comes into this world has a Satan nature, the sin nature. And every soul that comes into this world is operating from the Satan nature and doesn't know it. If you walked up to a person out on the street here, you wouldn't go up to them with this kind of witness and say, well, friend, you've got the devil in you. You've got Satan in you, and his nature is overwhelming and leading and guiding you. And so you better do what we ask you to do. You wouldn't say that. They'd turn you right off. So you don't say you got the devil in. In fact, this is such a new understanding in uh, theology today. No one speaks of it like this. Everybody that goes deeper speaks of a sin nature, but nobody speaks of it as being Satan's nature. Isn't that, isn't that peculiar? How could you have a sin nature and it not be a Satan nature? Mm -hmm. How could you get a nature from sin in the first place? Nature must come from a person, from a deity. And so uh, John was right. When, when he writes in his epistle, he finally gives us the information we need on this subject. But sinners don't know they have Satan in them. And while I'm on this subject, remember when we say that they have a Satan nature, that doesn't mean they're demon-possessed. Now, they could be. But that doesn't mean that they're demon-possessed. Big difference there. Well, we don't have that kind of language today, so we don't run around saying that sinners have the devil in them. Oh, we playfully say that about anybody. You can say that about anybody. My, that's the devil, or the devil made me do it, the colloquialism, or whatever. But the, but the facts are we don't attribute a person's uh, bad decisions to the devil. And really, that's what it is. It is a Satan nature that's in them. Now, that's not demon possession. They can be very good people and still have the soulish mechanism of making choices they can make a choice not to drink, not to take drugs, not to, not to do evil. They can, they can still make that choice even though they have the Satan nature. And that's why, that's why the gospel doesn't speak of, of the self being changed, ceasing to sin. And that's why we're, we're very uh, 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 adamant on this subject. We don't beat around the bush. We don't say that we're after this change up here, that you quit your sinning. That's not the issue. What we're after is an exchange of natures, an exchange, uh, sin nature out, God nature in. That's what the gospel is. That's what God's interested in uh, because you, you must know that a lot of people have a Satan nature. They have a sin nature and do good things. And remember, as we always say, uh, sinful people do good things and say people do bad things. So the doing has nothing to do with it. See. That's, that's what we're getting away from. We're finally getting down to the nitty-gritty of the true gospel where it isn't what you do that determines. It's who you are. So, uh, soulishly speaking, a sinner has a right to make decisions. They can make a decision not to do bad things. Even though they've got a Satan nature in them, they can make a decision not to do bad things. And you know what? I don't think the devil, the sin nature in them, will argue with that. I don't think this, the sin nature in them argues that. Because I don't think the devil cares whether you're good or bad. In fact, I think the devil would rather you be real good. Be real good. That's not salvation. Being good is not salvation. Ceasing to sin is not salvation. And so I think the devil, I, I've always suspicioned that the devil would rather have us real good than real bad. Because you're more deceived. The most deceived people in the world are the people who do good and are unsaved. 
And the next most deceived people are the people who are born again and think they're doing good keeps them born again. See, they're deceived. Well, this is a sinner. He has the Satan nature in him, and the exchange comes because of the cross. But he still has a soulish part up here that makes decisions. Well, then we come to the believer. As we... Uh, uh, draw this picture about a believer who is body, soul, and spirit. We'll put Christ as his nature and spirit. Christ, Christ is his life. Christ is his nature. Now, he still has an independent soul or mind. The whole of the Christian walk is this person here coming to the knowledge that the only way he can function as a mind and express who he really is through body is by turning that mind over to Christ. Let allow this mind to be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. So it's him finally coming to this point to where he has turned that mind, the soul, over to the Christ that is in him in order that he might fulfill who and what he is. Now our point is that it takes the separation of soul and spirit to better understand yourself. I'll tell you what's wrong with a lot of people. If they've come to God under the law, the law keeps them so beat down that they believe they are nothings and nobodies, no count and no good. You know somebody like that. You know somebody probably right now who, who just feels like I cannot live for God, I can't work it out, I can't put it all together. I'm, I'm so depressed, I'm so blue, and uh, I'm certain that's why Christians backslide. It's because they really get weary with trying to live the life. What's the cure for these people? It's the separation of soul and spirit. They don't know the difference between what it is they're doing and who they are. Now that difference is radical. Until you begin to see who you are in Christ, you're never going to understand rightfully the things that you do. So to understand who you are and what it is you're doing, you have to make this separation. In my own life, I can tell you that until I was able to make a separation in soul and spirit, I stayed defeated in my, in my heart most of the time. I didn't pray enough. I didn't read the Bible enough. I didn't study enough. I wasn't good enough. I was defeated all of the time because I watched my expression, my soulish part, rather than depend upon my spirit, Christ in me. Well, you never get to understand yourself at that point. You can't understand yourself until you separate the two. When you want to separate soul and spirit and see that spirit is perfect and soul is always growing, then you understand yourself. Then you understand. Then you can say, well, I failed, but I'm growing. I didn't do what was right, but I'll do it. I'll try again. Not all is lost. Well, what happens to us under the law is that if we fail, all is lost. What do you do if you fail under the law? You go back to point one, start all over again. You go back just like you'd never been saved, and you start all over again. What does religion want us to do? This probationary spirit that's in the church today, it wants everybody that failed to go back and start all over again and prove themselves to us. No separation of soul and spirit. And there are people that ought to wait a period of time, I think, before they... Uh, take up uh, great responsibility spiritually again. But uh, I think the separation of soul and spirit would be the thing that would determine that, would, uh, uh, that they stand perfect before God, and if they know that and are understanding that, then they're ready to pick up and go on and grow. In fact, you never start over again. What you do is constantly grow. You constantly grow. Uh, if it looks like you backslid, you're really growing by that. It isn't bad. I've always said 
that it is, it is always good whatever you do. Whatever you do is always good. If you do bad, that's good for you. I'm talking about believers now. If you do good, that may be bad for you. But whether you do good or bad, it's good for you because you're still growing in it. Amen. See, you're still growing in it. Well, that takes a big load off of you. That means you didn't get excommunicated. You didn't get kicked out. Uh, you, you don't have to go back and start at point one again and while everybody's looking at you or laughing at you. Uh, it means that you have properly separated soul and spirit in your growth. And now then you have turned in your weakness to your strength, which is Christ in you. That's the key. Every time you fail, your weakness is emphasized, self-weakness, and that self then becomes more reliant upon Christ's husband, and you come under his head, and you keep on going. That's why we say uh, about 1 John 1, when a believer sins, all he does is ask God to forgive him and get up and go on. Get up and go on. See? Why? You don't go back to point one. You're learning still. If you do the same thing again, you're going to learn from it. You may do it several times, and God's going to forgive you several times because the learning process is the soulish part that's being saved. But spirit stands right before God at all times. So the separation of soul and spirit is to better understand who you are. Who am I? Well, I'm one in whom Christ lives. So if I don't meet your pattern, if I don't meet my own patterns, my own desires, my problem's not in spirit, my problem's in soul, that I continue to grow in my soulless part. So now that's really, that's really what soul and spirit is all about. And that brings us to our third point. <clears throat> The importance of separation of soul and spirit is to better understand your spiritual growth. I guess I've talked all around this subject, it seems to me today, to better understand our spiritual growth. Because you see, at, at some juncture of your walk with God, you become very cognizant of your spiritual growth. Uh, somebody makes you cognizant of it. Somebody reminds you of it. Are you growing spiritually? Have you, have you gained anything? Are you, are you fulfilling any desires? Are you growing up in Christ? Are you coming into full stature? Is there anything different about you? Well, uh, that's not an easy subject because everybody has a different background on it. I remember one time I went to a church that was pretty dead. And a lady came up to me and she said, you'll enjoy preaching here. said, our preacher has been here for 30 years and said he has never changed his preaching in 30 years. And she thought she was complimenting him. And so I, without thinking, said, oh my goodness, that's too bad. <laughs> because there was no growth. Well, their attitude of growth was holding their own. <coughs> And it's much that way in holding a circle. Hold on. Hold on. My wife was talking to me this morning about some people she knew who had about five doctrines 30 years ago and still had them today. No growth. No change. Same, same, same bandwagon. And you know they brag about that. They say, bless God, this has never changed. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. And it's the same, same thing. No growth. What is spiritual growth then? Spiritual growth really only takes place in the separation of soul and spirit. Now, why, why is that so? Well, let's uh, look at our diagram again. It is absolutely necessary that you see that because this part of you is perfect. It's perfect. Now, did you ever notice how we are when we are, uh, if you were a preacher, maybe you as, uh, as just a Bible student have this this problem, but you'd be reading along and the scripture said, be ye perfect as God is perfect and, and you are perfect. And you know how we'd change that. You'd go to some other version of the scripture and it'd say perfecting. It put, it, it wouldn't leave it perfect because it just didn't sound right. You couldn't be perfect. Well, you can only be perfect if you separate soul and spirit. Now, you know the importance of having Christ 
in you as a perfect life. My life is perfect. My expression of that life is not perfect, but my life is perfect. It's not only perfect, this life is sinless. It's sinless. The real Christ in me is sinless, and Christ is my life. So I live a sinless life. I don't demonstrate a sinless life always, but I live a sinless life. You say, oh, it's just a play on words. Not. It's a separation of soul and spirit, which is absolutely necessary. And so there's a part of me that's perfect. There's a part of me that's sinless. And there's a part of me that's eternal. Beloved, now you have eternal life dwelling in you. So this part of me stands before God in this way. If the Lord was to come, if the Lord, if the Lord was to come at any moment, this is what would make me ready. I am always ready to meet the Lord in my life. Well, what happens to this believer on the resurrection morning? Why is it? that he's perfect in this regard, but imperfect over here. Because this is, the, this is the side over here that's imperfect. Uh, this is the side over here that is sinful. This is the side over here that is temporary. In soul, I'm imperfect. In soul, I'm sinful. In soul, I'm temporary. Always remember this. We have commingled the Bible to where we say we want to get soul saved. We don't really want to get soul saved. We want to get nature's ex exchange. But we've commingled Old Testament idea where soul and spirit were the same with the New Testament. So we're still saying the saving of souls, which was Old Testament language. It, it literally ignores the cross. Because the cross was an exchange of natures, not just a saving of the mind. So this part over here is the very temporary part of us. This is the part that is perfect and ceases to grow. This is where I'm growing in soul. Always growing. Always growing. Well, on the resurrection morning... This is what's going to happen to me. Why is it that in my expression down here, I'm imperfect? I don't care how strong Jesus is in me. It comes out of me imperfect down here. Well, my big problem is <clears throat> that I've got certain pulls from this body. Body pulls. Flesh. That's always reaching after my soul, my imperfect soul. And in my thinking, these imperfect thoughts fit. I can lie to you, but I can't lie to myself. I'm not a real good person. Why? That fits. What do I have? I have a body pull that reaches up after my mind. I've got something in my body that reaches up after my mind, my soulish part, that pulls on me. And that's the way it's going to be till the resurrection morning. The apostle Paul said, therefore, we groan to get out of these bodies. Why do we groan to get out of these bodies? Because this body has always expressed imperfection, sinfulness, and a temporary relationship with God. That's all it knows. And since the body doesn't get saved, there's no redemption for the body here and now. We've always got these pulls that sort of fit. I just don't feel right today. You ever hear anybody say, I just don't feel right today. I need to get in a good meeting. I need to get in a good prayer meeting. I need to get where somebody lays hands on me. I need something done. I need to do something and somebody do something to me. Why? 
because these body pulls have just pulled us down and conquered our souls, conquered our minds, because that's all body knows. So Paul said we groan to get out of these bodies. But look what happens. On the resurrection morning, you get a new body. Why is it that the final part of salvation, the salvation of the body, is put off till the resurrection morning? It is because these body pulls coming out of a sinful body to our soul, our mind, those body pulls are what determines our love. Why? It is in body that we have the contrast. The contrast in the body that will never be saved is that it fits sin better than it fits righteousness. It's more adjusted to temporal living up today and down tomorrow than it is coming into that rest where I know who I am in Christ. It fits. It all fits. But on the resurrection morning, you get a body that's co-equal to spirit, to Christ. But you still don't have the change in soul. You know what change we're going to get in our minds on the resurrection morning? a stopping, a ceasing of the body pulls to the mind. And all of a sudden, instead of us having that war waging from body to mind and pulling us down, we're going to have a body that's co-equal to spirit so that who we are by Christ in us will be perfect in body and soul. But... What you know in soul throughout eternity is going to grow. You're going to always be learning. Always coming to know Christ more and more as God's nature in you and you as the offspring of God. Now, that's the way we come to understand our growth, our spiritual growth. It's a real problem of some people about their spiritual growth. I used to deal with the subject when I taught in deeper life. And I'd always tell people that spiritual growth is nothing but understanding. I really don't know where I got that except by the Spirit, but now then I see it more clearly. Spiritual growth is growing soulishly. Because you don't grow at all. Christ, Christ doesn't become more in you. He becomes more expressed by you, but he doesn't become more in you. You understand that already. You got that fixed, haven't you? There's no more God for you. You're not going to get any more God than you got in you now. The expression, the soulish part, is what we're dealing with. So until you separate soul and spirit, you, you'll sort of be in this uh, place like David was, always crying out to God, always loving God, always praising. But there is a note in most of David's psalms that I'm... That, that unless I get a hold of God, woe is me. I'm lost, I'm undone, woe is me. So as a believer, he hadn't come to the separation of soul and spirit, which is where the Old Testament is. That's where it all is. But in the New Testament, you can separate the two by the preaching of the Word. You preach the Word and you get that separation. The separation is necessary to understand our spiritual growth. But let's spell it out now with some scripture that will help you. Uh, go to Isaiah 28. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 28. These are our, some of our favorite scriptures because Paul mentions uh, these scriptures uh, in 1 Corinthians 14 and 22 specifically. But these are important scriptures because they help us to see something stated in the Old Testament that is imperative to our spiritual growth. Beginning at verse 9 of Isaiah 28, he says, Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? All right, do you understand what's at focal point here? Uh, what we really have working here is, is a soulish matter where we have, where we have the words knowledge knowledge and doctrine we have mind in the center these are mind operations doctrine and knowledge 
are mind operations, meaning they have to do with something you know, what is doctrine, what you know about God, knowledge, the knowing. So we have the knowledge and doctrine words here relating to the mind. And so we might say in this first line of this ninth verse that the ones that God is going to bring something to the mind of, last part of verse 9, are of those who are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. Weaned from the milk, that is, those who have stopped depending upon somebody else to do it for them. Drawn from the breast. Stop depending upon man. And then he, in the 10th verse, gives us the lines we love so much. Our television, uh, our videos are called Precept Upon Precept, and our, our uh, weekly lessons are called Line Upon Line, taken from this verse. And, and what he says here, for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. All right, what is it that's working here? What is spiritual growth? It is knowledge and doctrine coming by every means possible, precept upon precept, line upon line. Where is it coming? Into the soul, into the soul. Precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little. Now, this takes us back to Hebrews 4 and 12 for a moment. He says, for the word of God is sharp and powerful more than any two-edged sword dividing asunder soul and spirit. The word of God. What is the Word of God? Let's, let's break it down into Pauline language. It's the preaching of the gospel. The Word of God, let's say, is the preaching of the gospel. So what we would say here is that the preaching of the gospel is precept upon precept, line upon line. The preaching of the gospel, therefore, gives us a little here and a little there of precepts and lines upon line. Now, are you following me? What I'm wanting to say, I'm wanting to say that if the gospel that is preached has not as its intent the feeding of the soul concerning the spirit, the believer is malnourished and never will spiritually grow. I was listening to a preacher this week a four-square preacher. You've heard of the four-square church. That's a misnomer. They call it the four-square gospel. There is no such thing. There is no such thing as a four-square gospel. Not being vindictive to that church at all. They're, they're wonderful people, I'm sure. But there is no four-square gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ that is the power of God under salvation is not what we call a four-square gospel. You don't know why? Because the four square gospel says Jesus saves, Jesus heals, Jesus fills, and Jesus is coming back. That's not the gospel. See, that's real radical of me. But that's not the gospel. What is it then? That's what he does. What is the gospel then? The gospel is who he is. The gospel is not believing what he does. The gospel is believing who he is. Who is he? The Lamb of God for sinners slain. What's that based on? His history. Not what he's doing today, but his history. So you can see something that's happened to us in the church, that we have multitudes of people who base their relationship with God on something he did for them. Now, I don't want to be radical here, but uh, I want you to see something. I think there is a multitude of people who have had something great done for them by God who don't know who they are in Christ and have allowed that knowledge, soulish knowledge of what God did for them to constitute a relationship with God and it can't.
A relationship with God must be based on a birthing, something that happened at Calvary, and not on something God did for them. I'll go a step further. I came into Pentecost through a mother. We came out of the Baptist church into Pentecost because my Baptist mother, who did not believe God could heal, was miraculously healed by God. Marvelous miracle. Saved her life. She was dying. Saved her life. And do you know what? I look back on it now, and our whole existence for God for many years was based on that great miracle. Something God does. And we call that the full gospel. But in all of it, I never saw Christ as life myself, nor did anybody else. And when I started preaching, I preached 13 years before I had a conception that Christ was my life. Because I based my understanding of the gospel on something God was doing. Come over here to this meeting. Look what God's doing. God's alive. God's real. God's doing something. But that isn't salvation because salvation is not based on what he does. It's based on who he is. Our life is not based on what he does because everything he does is an outer thing. It's outer. What he did is the inner thing. And that's why we simply believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to have it happen and take place in our life. So our spiritual growth comes about with a little here and a little there. Now that's why... I get real excited listening to people talk. We have some folks that don't want anybody to talk in our meetings. They just want to hear the word. But I get excited because I like to hear people talk because I see the precept upon precept and line upon line coming to them. Now, a lot of times it doesn't come like I'd like to see it in the format I want to see it. But I see them growing. What is spiritual growth? It's spiritual knowledge in operation. It's you taking what the Spirit has taught you and putting it to work. But that spiritual knowledge must be contingent on the gospel you heard. If the gospel isn't preached, then you're not getting anything. And so I love to hear people talk because I hear them say the line upon line and precept upon precept. They're getting something. It, it's coming through to them, not, not like I'd like necessarily and not what I say necessarily, but it's coming through to them. And that's what the gospel is all about. Well, uh, You get a little here, and you get a little there. It begins to work out of you. But you see, that's why we do what we're doing in the Christ life right now. Somebody's always saying, why in the world you go up to Washington or in Oregon? Why don't you stay here in Texas? And, of course, we could get just a big crowd in Texas and just as many people there as we could here. But we go where the door is open and where God has led. Why do we do that? Because it is precept upon precept and line upon line. It is my belief that Every time we get together, the Spirit will show us something new and different. He'll show us something that will cause us to get a little here and a little there. Where is that getting? It's in soul. Our souls are growing. Our souls are being fed. Our souls are being manifested. And we're, we're now, every time this soul grows, every time that soul grows, it shuts off another body pool. Are you listening to me? You'll never get them all shut off because you'll get down maybe the last one, be crying with Paul, oh, to get out of this body. But every time you grow in your knowledge and understanding, in your knowledge and doctrine, a little here and a little there, you shut off the pull from the body. They're shut off. They have less impact and pull on you. Well, now you can see something, don't you? You see, what really happens to us is that sooner or later those pulls from the body get so shut down or shut off that the real us that God made us to be begins to surface. What were these pulls from the body? They were pulls that came from Satan when he was our nature. Working in our bodies, all sorts. What was it? Uh, Romans 6, working all sorts of sin in our bodies. And so when he got put out, the body still had those feelings like a haunted house, we call it. And now as you grow in soul, 
you begin to shut off those pulls. And as you shut off those pulls from the old way of doing things, that's crucifying the flesh. That's bringing the old man under subjection. What is the old way of doing things? As you do that, then the real self, the real self God created begins to come about. That's the beauty of walking in the Spirit. The real self that God created begins. Because now you have begun to shut off that flow to your soul of the old way of doing things. And as you shut them off, then who you really are without that bad representation that came by Satan is shut off. And the real you surfaces. The real who God made you to be. Well, just in case you think you're going to get perfect in body and soul, I'll tell you, about the time you get one thing shut off, another thing surfaces. So what happens is that deepens your love. You finally fall so much in love with him, you'll say that you can't move or live or do anything without him. Christ is all, and I can do nothing of myself. I do nothing of myself. Uh, because you have now begun to grow up in him. But how do you get that? A little here and a little there. A little here and a little there. That's why I wouldn't miss a meeting. That's why I wouldn't miss gathering with you. Somebody told me yesterday over at Salem they didn't come last month to the meeting. And they said, well, we just uh, thought uh, that there was some change in the schedule. And I thought, my, I would have inquired around. I wouldn't have missed a month. Not because Litzman was there, but I want a little here and a little there because I'm coming into who I am. I'm coming into my real self, the, the real personhood, because Christ has fulfilled the part that was missing. But now as I crucify the flesh, shut off these pools, and as I grow in my knowledge and doctrine, understanding of who I am in this Christ, I stop the old man. I stop it. What is the old man? That's the old way of doing things. I shut off the channels that he had to my mind before. They're, they're shut off. Don't do that anymore. And so the separation of soul and spirit is absolutely necessary to your spiritual growth. But let's look back at these verses in Isaiah 28 for just a moment. He says, For precept must be upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little, for with stammering lips, and another tongue will he speak to this people. Now what people is he going to speak to? Those that he'll teach knowledge and doctrine to. They're the ones he's going to speak to. Will he speak to this people? Well now we, we see something very strange here. And we've gone through this before. But I think it fits right here again since we're on these particular verses. Speaking in tongues for most believers certainly doesn't bring them doctrine and knowledge. Far from it. In fact, most people do as well if they never talked in tongue. But he says, stammering lips and another tongue have a purpose. What is that purpose? God will speak to this people. What will he do? God will bring knowledge and doctrine to this people. What did they do to get that? They had stammering lips and another tongue. Where is stammering lips and another tongue? Who is it that speaks in tongues? It's the self. It's the self. What does Acts 2, 4 say? It says they all fill with the Holy Ghost and they, not God, they begin to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave up. Nowhere in the Scripture does it say God talks in tongues. It's always the self, the human being that talks in tongues. Why then is tongues connected with this scripture where doctrine and knowledge are what we're seeking after. It's because whenever this self, whenever this mind speaks words it doesn't know, it has cultivated a spiritual line whereby God can speak to this person 
knowledge and doctrine. Then what did the tongues do? It caused this self for the first time to lose control of what it thinks and opened it up to make a choice for spiritual truth. What does tongues do? Every time you talk in tongues, you are purifying the mind for spiritual truth. You're seeing that I within myself don't do this. This is of the spirit. This understanding is of the spirit. The tongue talking doesn't bring the knowledge itself, but the tongue talking opens the mind with stammering lips and another tongue. Can he speak to this person? Why? You've created a spiritual channel for God to come through. And that word which you receive in knowledge and doctrine is spirit. It's spirit. It's, it's God, uh, the Lord talking to the woman at the well. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. That's when the mind is prepared for that. So speaking in tongues is very soulish. Now you see, I wouldn't get by with this in a lot of Pentecostal places. But it's a very soulish thing. It's the believer doing it himself, and he is acknowledging a loss of control of his very mind. Why is that important? Because the Lord would like to have that position where you were losing control and was trusting him. Now he can bring knowledge and doctrine. Tongue talking doesn't give us knowledge and doctrine, but it opens up the channel whereby God may speak to us and give us that information. And the more knowledge and doctrine that goes in to this mind, the more of these pulls are going to be canceled out. And the more of those pulls that are canceled out, the more the expression is of this Christ who is the life. Of Christ who is the life. Well, if we had not come in this understanding to some point where we separated man, body, soul, and spirit, then we couldn't understand the scriptures. That was our first point. Furthermore, I couldn't understand myself. I'd be like the man in Romans 7. Why do I, if I'm saved, if I'm born again, why do I keep doing the same old things I, keep, I did before I was saved? Why do I still think like that sometimes? Why? It's because I haven't separated soul and spirit. So finally the gospel must come, as Hebrews 4 and 12 says, that the word must be preached that brings about this separation. So let's, let's close this session with that. This is a favorite subject. The gospel that is preached makes a lot of difference. I have been very careful through the years not to tell people to quit going to church or believe in a certain thing or uh, accepting certain doctrines because this is a new baby that God has put on the doorstep of the church of Jesus Christ and he wants us to take it in and we're having to learn an awful lot with this new baby called the Christ life. And in all of our groups we had people that's come out of everything. I don't know hardly a doctrine from, uh, from uh, far eastern religions to Christian science to Catholicism to Pentecostals that we don't have in our groups across the country, all kinds of people. So I've never said that you need to denounce this. You need to stop this. And you need to stop going to church. You need to stop going to this place. You need to stop this or stop that. But I'll tell you what I've done, and maybe nobody caught it. Again and again I've said it makes a lot of difference what you're listening to makes a lot of difference what gospel is preached to you. Because if you keep going to a place that preaches a commingle gospel, you're going to fall right back into the same old patterns, the old man patterns, because there's no separation of soul and spirit there. It is the true gospel that separates soul and spirit, because he said the word of God is sharp and powerful than any two-edged sword. That's a violent that's a violent separation of soul and spirit. Instead of me getting up and saying, folks, if you keep on sinning like this, you're going to all go to hell. Now that sounds like good gospel preaching. But that's not what they needed. They're believers, and they need to be told from the preaching of the gospel that they separate soul and spirit. 
that your soul needs to grow. You need to learn of the Lord. Yeah. Your spirit stands perfect before God. And if you know you stand perfect before God, that's going to cause soul growth because you'll love him. If you don't love him, then you may not be saved anyhow. That's the gospel. So it makes a difference what kind of gospel you have. If you keep hearing a gospel that you can't handle, then quit it. We've got different kinds of people, all, all different kinds of people. Uh, I talk, we talked with a lady uh, this last week who is, who is very, uh, well, she's very adapted. She believes this message, and she can go to a church that doesn't believe this message and has a place to witness there, tell others about it. And then I know some little ladies that cannot afford to hear something that's contrary to this message. And you know what I tell them? I say, be who you are. I told the other lady, be who you are. You that can't stand to hear this, just don't go back. Be who you are. You see? Because God made us all different. But I'll tell you this. You'll not separate soul and spirit listening to a commingled gospel because the Word of God will separate soul and spirit. The preaching of the Word of God will separate it sooner or later. So where does that leave us? Mostly the true gospel isn't preached. Mostly it isn't preached. So people are bewildered or floundering or frustrated and defeated because the true gospel is not preached. God help us to catch a vision of the need for the true gospel and to preach it with and by everything that is within us. And I think we'll quit right there. Another hour has gone by. God love you.